Good evening to you all. My name is Jay Hurvitz. I'm from the Moffitt Institute. And basically because of my English, I am the uh, host for this evening's session, How the Brain Learns Language and What It Means for Teaching. Um, I intend to learn a lot this evening because there's a lot I don't know about the subject and it frankly is a fascinating one. We have three presenters this evening, Tali Bitan, James Booth, Bidran Jonik, who will be with us, I hope, soon. And they work together, which Tali will explain very soon. Uh, Tali will present me about the de development of a Hebrew reading brain, coping with missing vowels and a rich morphology. As someone who learned Hebrew as an adult, uh, I admit that missing vowels was problematic. It was even harder for my father to believe it was possible. Uh, the second presentation from James Booth, the differences between languages and the brain, basis of reading acquisition, English versus Chinese, which I admit will be fascinating. And our third will be a workshop from Vidran Dronjik. I hope I pronounced that correctly. What research can teach us about teaching second language vocabulary? Um, there's so much to read about what Tali Bitan does that I think I'll just show this here because if I would read the entire thing, I would be already taking her away from her uh, presentation. So I'm going to stop my sharing and invite Tali to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you see my presentation? We do. Okay, thanks. So indeed, this is the topic of our webinar, how, how the brain learns language and what does it mean for teaching? And this webinar is a product of a, a joint grant we, I received with my colleagues, uh, James and Bedran, uh, from the National Science Foundation and the Binational Science Foundation, like the Israel uh, US, to study the effects of the first language on the neural processes of learning second language. But this project is still uh, in progress, it's ongoing. So we won't be talking about the results of uh, this study yet. Uh, and instead we'll present you um, other stuff that we have been working on uh, in our different labs. And, and our goal is to bring the scientific knowledge that we are working on acquiring in our research uh, to the knowledge of professionals uh, in the field of education and other fields. Um, so before we go uh, more directly into the subject matter, I just wanted to highlight uh, the, the methods we're working with. So traditionally, uh, studying the way the brain processes language would, uh, would only require us to look at people with brain lesions and uh, study how they process language. But uh, thanks to the advent of uh, having the neuroimaging technology, in the last two decades, we were able to scan people in an MRI and look at the, what, how their brain functions and what brain regions are involved when they're processing language. Uh, and we're looking at healthy people. And this is the method uh, I will be, uh, my results will be based on. Um, and you'll see some of it in, a, in the next few slides. So, in, and thanks or, or, or somewhat thanks to this uh, technology, we know today that the brain is very plastic. And when I, pl I say plastic, I mean both in terms of how it functions, but also in terms of how it is structured. So the brain plasticity means that the individual's experience in life affects the, the way their brain functions and uh, the way it is structured. So that means that if different people have different experiences, the language they speak and the language they read, it implies that their brain will work and be structured a little bit differently from other people using different languages. And this is precisely what we're interested in, how cross-linguistic differences and differences in the <clears throat> writing systems that people are using, how that affects the way their brain functions, uh, the reading and language networks in their brain. 
In terms of uh, having different languages, so the experience of having more than a single language <clears throat> in just one brain, it is known to affect the processing of language. And there are, there are a few uh, myths and some uh, variables that we do know today to be affecting the way the language is processed. So uh, uh, proficiency and exposure how much uh, everybody is, ex is exposed to each specific language during the everyday, uh, the, their everyday does affect the way the brain processes the language. The issue of age of acquisition of the language, so whether this is an L1 or an L2, did we acquire it very early or a bit later? That's another variable that people think may be affecting, but it has less evidence compared to the proficiency and the amount of exposure, which is surely to affect the, the processing in the brain. There are also hypotheses about the way we teach the other language. Is it through immersion or is it through formal instruction? And a lot of research is devoted to studying that. Does that affect the brain representation? And this is still debated. And very interestingly, the specific structure and the specific of the language and the orthography, how do they affect uh, uh, the processing in the brain? So can, can we say that languages that have uh, roots like Semitic languages or uh, languages that in which the writing system is more or less transparent, are they represented differently in the brain? And this is part of the question I'll, start, I'll try to answer today but in, uh, within language um, design. And I only wanna mention that it, it, the people used to think that there is a huge divide in the brain between areas that are devoted to first language and areas that are devoted to the second language. Maybe it was, they thought it was even uh, split by hemisphere, like left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And we don't see evidence for such a dichotomous um, differentiation between regions that uh, um, are used to process the different languages. So in my talk, I will in, in my talk and in James's talk, we'll talk more about reading. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, a recent or a current model for reading in the brain. So this is the front area of the brain, and this is the back of the brain. Uh, typically reading, of course, it's a visual process. So we, uh, the input is visual. So it starts from a very low level sensory visual processing area. And um, immediately after that, uh, orthographic processing area uh, is kicks in and is involved. And then you can see here lots of arrows and uh, going in different directions. And the important thing to note is that in green, this is the network that is involved in processing the meaning, the semantics of the words. In, in orange here is the network involved in phonology, in processing the sounds of words. And these, all these arrows suggest that there are reciprocal and uh, all these areas and both of these networks are interconnected. And we'll, go, we'll come back to these areas and this model uh, later. Another thing that is important to keep in mind is that these processes in the brain change during development and while children acquire reading in their language. As you can imagine, most of the studies on reading acquisition were done in English, not surprisingly. And J James will tell you more about specific uh, brain changes related to the development or the acquisition of reading in English. I just wanna mention two of the um, major changes that we see in children. One of them is in the area that is involved in orthographic processing. We see that activation in this area increases and there is more and more specificity as children acquire reading. And also this frontal area does show an increase during development and it is suggested to be involved in processing the sounds and in lexical retrieval. This slide is here just to, sh to, to show you that in general, 
the network, the, the language network, is very similar across different languages. So this is from a study that compared Spanish, English, Hebrew, and Chinese, which are very different in terms of their orthographic transparency, orthographic transparency being the systematicity or the consistency in which letters are mapped to sounds. So they're very different. Uh, the, 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 the units that are being mapped are very different, are the single letters or morphemes. Uh, and still we see a very similar or generally universal language and reading network. However, in, if looking in more details, we also see differences that are related to uh, orthographic transparency. So for example, a region that is involved in mapping letters to sounds is more involved in uh, when reading a transparent orthography or uh, um, languages or orthographies like uh, Mandarin in Chinese activate the orthographic area more bilaterally rather than on left lateralized. So in addition to the common network, there are also uh, major differences between different languages and orthographies. And this is uh, what we want to focus on today. So I don't have to go through it because Jay has already uh, mentioned the uh, different uh, titles of our specific talks. So yeah, I will focus on Hebrew and how children, how the brain of children acquiring reading in Hebrew, uh, how does it change during development? And my collaborators he, are here. All these are my uh, former and current uh, students and postdocs. And this was done in collaboration with Professor Tami Katsir from uh, Haifa University. And we want to focus on two of the unique properties of Hebrew, of the Hebrew orthography, that many of you may be familiar with them, especially if you uh, read in Hebrew or you teach Hebrew. So you know that there is the issue of transparency, the diacritics, Likud, uh, with diacritics. The orthography is very transparent. It's really easy to uh, map letters to sounds. And without the Likud, without the vowels, uh, we, we don't know whether this word should be read sefer, safar, sapar, or sfar, um, if it's not in a context of a full uh, sentence. The transition between reading with diacritics and without diacritics uh, happens around third grade in, in Israel in, a, a, in primary school. Um, and adults read uh, pointed words, words with diacritics, very rarely, only if they read uh, poems or they read the Bible. Otherwise, they don't use so much the diacritics sometimes. They, so it's less familiar to them and sometimes they even forget how to map them. In contrast, we have the vowel letters, which are less transparent, so they're more ambiguous and more partial. But on the other hand, they are there, they are very familiar, even adult readers use them and they are, see them all the time. The other property that we're interested in is morphology, the, the structure of roots or the three consonantal root plus pattern. Uh, which is unique to uh, Semitic languages or mostly. Um, and we're interested in the relationship and the interaction between uh, morphological processing and the transparency of the script. So these are the two uh, questions or two studies I will present to you today. The effect of orthographic transparency on the brain in skilled readers and beginning readers and the reliance on morphology. So do readers decompose or segment the word they read into the root and the template and does it help them? Do they do it more when the script is transparent or non-transparent? Does it help, help them compensate for the lack of transparency? And again, in skilled readers and in beginning readers. So we'll start with the uh, question on transparency. Uh, specifically, in adults, we want to we want to ask whether the diacritics providing this transparency uh, do they, do adults process them even do they benefit from them and is it similar or different to what they do with vowel letters and similar questions we want to ask about children because children are obviously 
more or different uh, children in different grades are more used to reading diacritics. They need them in initial stages. So what does it look like in the brain? So to ask these questions, we have a, a behavioral study where children were just, uh, children and adults were just reading a oral reading of single words from the screen and an fMRI study where they lie in the scanner in the fMRI and we look at the brain regions that are activated. You can see that we have adult readers, we have dyslexics, which I'll not talk about today, and we have children in second grade and fifth grade, and these were very hard to uh, convince to, to go into the scanner, so we have very small samples uh, for, the, for the fMRI in the children. So for the first study, where, where we are looking at transparency, we presented them with words with diacritic marks, pointed words and unpointed words. Words were short or long in terms of the number of consonants and either had a vowel letter or, or didn't have a vowel letter. And again, the task is just reading the words aloud. So what do we see in adults? In adults, we see that showing the pointed words increases activation, increases the load of mapping uh, letters to sound and also uh, regions that are uh, involved in lexical access. So uh, even though the diacritics, the points, do not benefit skilled readers, they don't need them, they, they're not performing any better with points, we still see that they are processing them and it, it, it takes, it takes a, a, a load from them to, to process the diacritics. In contrast, reading words with vowel letters decreases the load in the same brain regions or more or less the same brain regions and the, the effect is facilitatory. So reading words with vowel letters has exactly the opposite effect compared to reading words with diacritics. Even though the uh, vowel letters are not giving the full vowel information, they are ambiguous and all the other things, Still, we think that this is because familiarity is more important than transparency for adult readers, for skilled adult readers. So what happens with children? We know that children are more, should be more dependent on the diacritics. And indeed, we see that in terms of behavior, young children, so second and third grade children, they do need the diacritics in turn, it, it does facilitate that they are reading more accurately where they have diacritics, but only the older children around five, fifth or sixth grade, they show a brain difference in which phonological or processing of the sound is more efficient and is done better with the diacritics. So the effect is quite different from adults. And what happens with vowel letters? Vowel letters do facilitate reading in children similarly to adults. So they, they benefit from vowel letters, but the benefit is quite different. Now we see it in a region processing orthography. So while in adults, we saw the facilitation in regions associated with mapping orthography to phonology, uh, here in, in children, we see the effect in orthographic processing. So looking at a word that has vowel letters reduces probably the competition from other words, orthographic competition from other words. So we see a completely different effect in the brain. Uh, the effect of transparency affects children and adults very differently. Now to the second question, which was how does morphology affect reading in Hebrew? Um, so specifically our questions here, are, first of all, do adults and children rely on morphological segmentation? So do they decompose the roots and templates more when they read a non-transparent word? So when the word is not transparent, do they rely more? Does it help them compensate for the lack of transparency uh, uh, by relying on the morphological structure? And the other question is more specifically related to children, we know that in English and other languages, morphological decomposition is considered to be a, a later process. So initially reading is supposed to rely more on phonology and morphology should kick in 
maybe in later years of uh, primary school. Our hypothesis was that because morphology is so prominent in Hebrew, maybe younger children will show the effects that are not seen in other languages. So this is a question, of course, we're not directly comparing uh, to reading in other languages, but we're comparing it to the literature. So for this study, we again used the same task, oral reading of single words. And here we presented again, words with diacritics and without diacritics, but another manipulation here was words with root and template and words that are monomorphemic, have just one morpheme. You cannot decompose them into a, a root and template. So what did we see in the fMRI? So first in adults, in skilled readers, we do see a morphological effect. So when adults read morphologically complex words or not complex, but uh, bimorphemic words, words that have a root and a template, they activate uh, frontal regions um, more than when they, uh, or less, I mean, there is a morphological effect and it, it is in frontal areas that are involved in morphophonological decomposition. Um, interestingly, we see this effect only in unpointed words. We don't see it in pointed words. So this suggests that indeed morphophonological decomposition is a made or it could compensate for the lack of transparency in the unpointed words because only in the unpointed words we see this morphological effect. What do we see in children in the same task? In children too, we see a morphological effect, but first we see it in completely different areas. These temporal areas are mostly involved in semantic processing. So first thing we can say that the morphological process, processing is very different in adults and children, while in adults, we see it in areas involved in morphophonological decomposition. In children, it is presumably a more semantic processing. The morphology relies more on semantics. The other interesting, th interesting thing is that this is, uh, in contrast again to adults, we see it only in pointed words, in words with diacritics, rather than words without diacritics, which was the case in the adults. So while in adults we think that morphology helps to compensate for the lack of transparency, in children it looks like the transparency facilitates the morphological decomposition rather than the morphological decomposition compensating or being an alternative route to the phono phonological uh, decoding. Uh, so in early stages of reading acquisition, uh, we do see morphological decomposition in Hebrew reading children, but this relies more on semantics and it is facilitated by transparency rather than compensating for the lack of transparency. So to conclude, we do see developmental changes in brain activation and they involve the adaptation of the readers to the unique properties of the language. So we see changes in processing, transparency and morphology between uh, young children and older children and adults. We can also say that the effects of transparency and the effects of morphology depend on the reader's skill and on their specific experience because we see evidence for things that are different from other languages, other languages don't necessarily have these two versions of transparent and non-transparent. Uh, so in terms of transparency in skilled adults, the familiarity, the vowel letters, facilitate mapping of form to sound and facilitate lexical access. While the transparency of diacritics looks like it hinders it. In contrast, in children, vowel letters facilitate orthographic processing and the transparency enhances phonological processing. So the same cues, the same little marks have very different effects in adults and children um, on the cognitive processes involved in reading. 
And for the morphology, adults apply morphophonological processes for segmentation, and they rely on morphology, or they seem to rely on morphology for compensating for the lack of transparency. While children, first of all, they do segment, they, they show early in reading acquisition, they already rely on uh, morphological processing compared to uh, non-Semitic languages, but uh, the caveat is that we didn't test it directly. They rely more on semantics in morphological processing, and they uh, use the transparency to help to facilitate their morphological processing. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Tali. I'm going to allow people uh, to open their, uh, their microphones if they'd like. Uh, the people can also write into the chat. Um, uh, there was a question already, whether or not uh, you have something published which can be... Uh, um, sure, I um, will. Uh, I can upload it to the chat actually, well, after the questions. Very good, thank you. Um, are there questions uh, someone would like to respond to ask? What about adult learners of Hebrew? Are they more like children? The what? Mark Stober asks, what about adult learners of Hebrew? Are they more like children or do they behave as adults would? That's a really interesting question. We didn't study them. We didn't uh, study uh, adult learners of Hebrew. Um, I would imagine that they are not like children because they already have uh, a different first language. And we see that the experience the, the learner or the reader's experience does matter to how they process uh, the new language. So um, I don't know if they will be something in between or, or a third completely different pattern. Okay, we have a question from Shmulio Shalmi, which I think is for later on because he tells us he has to be leaving a little bit uh, in another half hour. Um, uh, but uh, if you'd like to have it asked now, Shmuel, uh, just let us know that. Uh, another question which was raised, based on your research, are there any recommendations to the field of education? In other words, are you people just doing studies just to see what people's brains look like, or what are we supposed to do with this? That's a great question, and this is why uh, we come here to interact with professionals and see what is your take on how we can Im uh, implement it. I can say very uh, cautiously that from, uh, for example, from these results about uh, the effect of diacritics, um, or yeah, we also see that the same similar effects of diacritics are seen in adults with dyslexia. So I would say that uh, I wouldn't use diacritics to, to help uh, or to, to in, in interventions for uh, individuals with dyslexia because when uh, the phonological deficit is there, relying on diacritics is really problematic. Uh, we do see that vowel letters are facilitatory even though they, they are so ambiguous and so partial. So knowing that familiarity is, is more important than the transparency or having the full phonological information, I think it can you know, I don't know exactly how to translate into the intervention or education um, practice, but I think bearing it in mind uh, that, I mean, I'm not saying we, you know, remove uh, the, the phonological cues, but uh, knowing that uh, you can use morphology with children, but the children do not process morphology similar to adults, uh, I think it can have uh, practical implications for, for planning uh, education. Um, but uh, Vedran will have more, not about reading, but it will have more practical uh, implications from, from the study. Another question asked you was about, what about bilingual children? Yeah, so, so as I said, I think uh, individual's experience matters a lot. Uh, so if they're bilingual, they're 
reading acquisition will be affected by being bilingual. It then depends uh, what other languages they are reading, if they read Arabic, which has also diacritics and has also Semitic uh, roots. I think uh, their reading acquisition can be, it will facilitate, that's my hypothesis, it will facilitate their acquisition of reading in Hebrew. If they have other languages in the background, it may um, maybe even interfere depending on how proficient they are in, in reading the other languages. Uh, we didn't study bilingual readers uh, of Hebrew, but this, I think this we can uh, infer from the literature. Okay. Um, there's still questions coming in, but I think, uh, first off, Shmuel, I have a hard time using a, a um, interpreting your question. I don't know exactly where it fits in. If you'd like to take a microphone, you may. And uh, one more question that came up here. Does it matter if the language is analytic or synthetic? Not sure what uh, they mean by right. analytic or synthetic. If they mean uh, the orthographic transparency, then I think it does, and, and this is what our research shows, that the specific uh, structure of the writing system and of the language does affect the, the brain mechanisms involved in acquiring it. Okay, I'm going to give a microphone here to Shmuel for a moment so that uh, he'll be able to ask his question because he's, you can try now. Ah, Rika, that was the wrong Shmuel. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I unmuted uh, my microphone. You hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. So I want uh, to ask you uh, how many uh, languages uh, uh, can uh, to learn uh, one person uh, uh, accept a uh, uh, first uh, language. Uh, what uh, uh, maximum of uh, languages uh, uh, can uh, everyone uh, to learn? Uh, I don't uh, think I, I don't think there is any maximum. I don't think uh, the literature shows that there is a specific maximum of languages. Thank you very much. Okay, Edith, if you'd like to ask your question. Yes, hi. Um, it was a bit hard to follow the professional terms in English, uh, but I have a question about, uh, uh, in simple terms, is this research like an in-depth research of what we Israelis know and what we learn as in teaching or in special education teaching um, that, and we automatically know that when we read Hebrew, we automatically um, know how to uh, read upside down and know uh, how to uh, complete a sentence, complete a word automatically. It's like, we just know. It's easier for Hebrew uh, speakers, uh, as the, the youngest you are when, when you start uh, at a young age, it's easier uh, as the years go. Um, and I'd like to know if that's the research, part of the research, like in more depth. And if uh, people who are learning it, it is a second language, how long do you know, if you know, how long does it take them to get to that place? Because now I'm teaching Hebrew as a second language to adults and some children. And I always tell them that this is our skill as the Hebrew speakers, even though they say that Hebrew is a hard la language. <laughs> yeah. The cherry well, on the <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a specific, you know, it really depends on okay. how, uh, how uh, extensive is this, uh, are they practicing, you know, what are their skills or pre previous skills? So I, I have no idea. I, I cannot say, you know, a number of how many years or months or would it take them to, to become proficient? Uh, in terms of your first question, um, I'm not sure I completely followed, but if what you meant was that 
for Hebrew readers, because we are used to reading without the vowels, we rely more on the whole word. If this is what you were referring to when you said we automatically know, because in, in models of, uh, of reading, uh, there is a debate of whether you go immediately from orthography, from the, from the sight of the word to its meaning, or do you have to go through the sound of the word? And some people are saying, you always go through the sound, even if it's really automatically and really fast, you don't feel it, but you still always go through the sound, the phonology. And other researchers say, no, when you are very skilled, you can go directly from the, from the sight of the word to the meaning of the word. You don't even need the sound. And then for Hebrew, because there are no vowels, then it's been suggested that yes, we, are, we identify words as whole units. We don't need to break them into the specific sounds. So in, in, in general, the, the finding in adults is consistent. I mean, the sh showing that familiarity overrides transparency does go, I think is consistent with, the, with this thought that for, for adult, for skilled readers, it is more important than, that the word is familiar. And if you add these little dots, it's even hindering them. It's not really helping them. And it makes them work harder on the mapping. And it, it doesn't do anything for them uh, because they don't already need or they don't need to rely on this process of mapping. They, they look at the whole word and this is captured more or less as a whole. But this does require going through these previous stages. You know, it's not like in the past that they said you can skip those phonics yeah. and, and go immediately to the stage of, of reading whole words. Because you were reading the, the phonics, because you were mapping as letters to sound so much, then the familiarity of the, the full word, the whole word becomes so familiar and so automatic and it's helpful to read it. Because you have more vocabulary and automatic vocabulary as well. That, that's another thing, which we didn't test in this. I mean, we didn't test- I'm going to thing. move on. I'm going to move on so that uh, some of us might even, for me, it's getting into night, some of you it's morning, some of you it's afternoon, but we're going to move on and uh, go on to our next presentation, which is from Professor James Booth, as uh, once again, his uh, CV is full enough for all of us to read it ourselves. Differences between languages in the brain basis of reading acquisition and the brain basis of reading is English versus Chinese. So James, you're welcome to take the screen and start your presentation. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again for having me. I'll share my screen uh, just before I do. Um, it was great to hear you talk Tali, uh, fantastic questions from the group. Um, fortunately, I think we're gonna hit on some of the same ideas. Uh, so, uh, so I see some nice synergy between, uh, between our two presentations. So uh, I, think that's, I think that's great. So let me go ahead and share my screen and you should be able to see all of your cells. Uh, but I'm going to now uh, get the PowerPoint up. Uh, it's up. It's up. Okay. Good. Adjust it a little bit here. Okay, great. Um, let me, I just want to adjust the zoom window so at least i can see a couple of you when i present so we're presenting just to a, a powerpoint <laughs> uh okay great so uh yeah i'm just honored to be here to talk about some of our um some of our work and uh this work has been supported by um the federal government here in the u.s so i should acknowledge them uh, I really want to acknowledge the, um, the lab. Uh, I do all my work in the context of the brain development lab, uh, but also the families uh, who have participated uh, over the course of uh, many years now. Uh, it's, uh, as, as Tali mentioned, it's quite challenging to do uh, MRI work uh, in kids. 
Um, when I go through some of my own work, you're going to see pictures down in the lower uh, left hand corner. And that is going to indicate the, the kind of the major contributor uh, of the work from my, uh, from my lab. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know, Jay, are you going to be sharing the PowerPoint that I sent to you? Um, if people want, you can share that uh, with them. It's a PDF of the presentation, so they should be able to get uh, uh, citations of uh, all the work if they're interested. Okay. If you give permission, it will be sent out along with the recording. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, so uh, yeah, so here's an outline of what I'll be talking about, the neurocognitive basis of the first and second languages. Uh, and then I'll focus in on Chinese, actually, uh, uh, talk about second language acquisition in Chinese, talk about cross-linguistic differences uh, for Chinese, uh, a little bit about dyslexia in Chinese, and then wrap it up with some conclusions. Um, in terms of um, kind of uh, more cognitive behavioral work, uh, one major conclusion from the literature as shown in uh, uh, meta-analyses is that there is a substantial transfer uh, between, uh, between the two languages. Uh, so uh, in this case, transfer from um, Chinese uh, to English. And what you see here is um, data for phonological awareness, effect size of about a, a point, uh, a point 0.5, which means about a half a standard deviation. Uh, here is transfer for vocabulary. It's a bit weaker, but still, uh, still uh, a significant transfer uh, of vocabulary knowledge from uh, Chinese uh, to English. Uh, in terms of the other domains uh, of language and reading, here we have um, uh, the meta-analysis showing um, transfer of uh, decoding, so reading aloud uh, from Chinese to English. And then finally, uh, here is the data from uh, morphological awareness. So again, you see some reliable transfer uh, between, uh, between the languages. Um, so uh, kind of one of the reasons why there is transfer, you know, I suppose is, uh, as Tali was mentioning, there's quite a bit of overlap, actually. Uh, so it's not left, left brain, right brain. <laughs> uh, I, I, you got to send me those studies, Tali, because uh, I, 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 maybe those are older studies, people arguing that, uh, yeah, one language is in the left, the other in the right. Um, so there's a lot of overlap uh, between, the two, uh, between the two languages. This is a meta-analysis that was done uh, in terms of the neuroimaging data. Uh, it broke out first versus second language, early learning versus late learning. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about these in detail, but uh, if you look at them, you'll see, you know, substantial overlap actually. Uh, between, uh, between the first and the second uh, language. It appears as though if you're kind of learning a language, um, second language late, uh, it seems as though there's the most robust uh, engagement of the language network uh, in that case. So that relates to Tali's comment about proficiency and exposure really matters, uh, you know, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the neural correlates of, uh, of language. Um, so in terms of the neurocognitive base of the first and second languages, uh, there's a significant correlation between all major components of the first and uh, second language, at least in terms of Chinese to English. There's lots of overlap between the languages, uh, but there are some differences, uh, and this is likely to depend upon uh, kind of amount of exposure uh, and proficiency. So as I said, I want to focus in on, uh, on Chinese uh, and to give you kind of just a, a quick uh, Primer uh, of Chinese, uh, it's different than English. Uh, uh, I guess uh, most of you have varying levels of proficiency with English, so I won't focus on that. Um, um, uh, Chinese is different in, uh, in the sense that it's uh, holistic and, and embedded. I'll give you examples um, of that. <laughs> uh, it's also less systematic in its mapping between uh, orthography and phonology as compared to English. Uh, and I'll give you examples of that. And then finally, uh, it, it appears to be, or it is more sy systematic in terms of mapping between orthography and, and, and semantics. Uh, and I'll give you some examples um, uh, of that. In terms of the holistic organization, here's just some, um, some examples of kind of three characters, which give you uh, a sense of this organization. Uh, uh, characters are made up of components, uh, often uh, radicals, which I'll talk about in a second. 
Um, but here you see uh, a left-right organization in the context of the word village. Here you see an inside-outside organization. So there's one component here and then another component surrounding it in the case of country. And then here you have a top-bottom organization. So here's one component and here's another component in the case of uh, a father. So it's complicated uh, visually, spatially, uh, and um, that's uh, quite different uh, than English, which is kind of linear left to right. Uh, in terms of uh, the mapping between orthography and phonology, uh, as I said, um, uh, there uh, is some systematicity there, but not as systematic as English. English is about 75% regular, you know, if you will. Um, so when you have the spelling, most often you know what the pronunciation is. In Chinese, it's lower. It's only about 25% reliable cues. Uh, but there are cues and they're called phonetic radicals. Uh, and here you have an example of a phonetic component, which gives you a cue to the pronunciation of these three words. Uh, so uh, uh, question, a mom, uh, you know, and dragonfly all have the uh, syllable ma in it. Uh, they're, pr they're pronounced with different tones, but it gives, a, it gives you kind of a cue to pronunciation. Chinese is unique, at least from English, in the sense that uh, it also has kind of um, um, these cues to meaning. Uh, so there's some systematicity at a uh, monomorphemic uh, level uh, to, um, to, to, to meaning. Uh, so they, uh, they have these things called uh, semantic radicals. Uh, so here's a semantic radical for mouth. Um, so, um, uh, this, this radical refers to things like mouth, talking, openings, entrances. So you could see it in a word like uh, to speak or to call, you know, or to eat. You can see in this case, this uh, semantic radical is in each of these, uh, each of these uh, words. So uh, there's a pretty systematic relationship. Uh, there are about 300 or so uh, semantic radicals in uh, uh, in written uh, in written Chinese. Okay, uh, so there are there are certainly some differences with English, um, uh, but the question is, does this difference relate to um, differences uh, in neural correlates? And um, you know, overall, you know, I'd say that there's a lot of overlap, you know, between uh, the two languages. Uh, I'd like to make that point again, um, uh, and shortly I'll talk about some uh, differences. In terms of the overlap, uh, the interesting thing is that at least for Chinese speakers, they seem to like assimilate English into their existing uh, language network. So here you have Chinese speakers speaking Chinese, English speakers speaking English. Uh, this is um, the Chinese network. So this is Chinese greater than English. Here's the English network. So this is English greater than Chinese. You can see that these two networks are, you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat different. Uh, but the interesting part about this is if you compare Chinese reading English to Chinese reading Chinese, um, there's no real difference. Uh, so what this tells you is that the Chinese speakers reading English basically use their Chinese network. Um, uh, so that when you compare the Chinese reading English to the English reading English, <laughs> you have this big difference, right? So, uh, so there is this kind of assimilation of... Um, you know, of um, English into their uh, Chinese network. And this may be reflective of the big transfer, you know, that you see, you know, in terms of behavior, in terms of all the, you know, major components of uh, language uh, and reading. So Chinese speakers mostly assimilate English into their native language network is the main, uh, is the main point I'd like to make uh, in this uh, section. But these are all like uh, bilinguals, you know, kind of, uh, or at least learning a second language. Um, so it may be that we kind of overestimate the similarity uh, between, uh, between the languages. So we've also done quite a bit of work looking at cross-linguistic differences. So looking at kind of native Chinese versus English uh, speakers. And um, in this case, maybe we'd expect larger differences. And let's just kind of step back for a second into the, um, uh, to the, the, the structural differences that we talked about in terms of Chinese versus English. So as you remember, uh, Chinese is more holistic. So in that case, uh, perhaps we're gonna see greater reliance on uh, visual orthographic regions in the brain, uh, maybe particularly on the right. Uh, uh, we also argue for this lack of systematicity and the orthophonological mapping. 
Uh, so maybe this would be associated with less engagement of these phonological regions. Tali mentioned that in her, uh, in her talk. And there's this higher systematicity of the orthographic to semantic mapping. And maybe this is associated with greater reliance on semantic uh, regions. I'm gonna reserve this last point uh, for when I talk about uh, dyslexia. So we'll come back to this third point in the last uh, section. So what's the evidence for these differential uh, bases of uh, reading in the two languages? Um, uh, the first uh, being this kind of maybe reliance on visual spatial or visual orthographic processing in Chinese. There's actually quite a bit of evidence. This is an interesting meta-analysis that came out looking at different kinds of visual processing measures uh, and showed that there was a correlation with reading skill, particularly for this visual verbal association. And it makes perfect sense because what this task uh, requires you to do is to look uh, to, to basically um, learn an association between kind of this abstract symbol and a verbal label. Um, so, uh, so that makes perfect sense that it'd be uh, highly correlated with reading skill uh, in Chinese. It seems to be a little bit different uh, in English. Uh, so English uh, is highly associated with different kinds of phonological processing. Uh, so this is a nice meta-analysis that came out looking at phonemic awareness, rhyme awareness, and verbal uh, short-term memory. And again, here we see this kind of pretty robust uh, relationship. Um, it's not that phonological awareness isn't associated with reading in Chinese, it's just less robustly, uh, robustly so. Okay, so, um, so uh, these behavioral differences may uh, kind of reflect uh, in different neural correlates. Uh, again, we expect a lot of overlap uh, and perhaps the overlap is represented here in green. So frontal regions and these uh, temporal regions. I'm going to focus in this section in terms of uh, differences between the languages. So uh, visual orthographic regions are associated with um, kind of occipital cortex up into uh, uh, parietal cortex. Uh, and phonological regions are associated with kind of superior temporal cortex into kind of inferior parietal uh, cortex. So we'll focus on kind of the, uh, the red and blue regions, if you will, in terms of looking at the uh, cross-linguistic uh, differences. So we've done a bunch of studies uh, trying to develop kind of parallel tasks in the two languages, which is quite a challenge to do, uh, but we think we've done it uh, pretty uh, effectively. So we've done similar manipulations uh, in, um, in, in uh, English as well. I'll give you just the Chinese examples here where they make rhyming judgments, both in the auditory and the visual modality. Here, they just have to determine whether these two words uh, rhyme. Uh, and in this case, they don't rhyme, uh, but they actually share, uh, they share a, um, uh, a phonetic radical. In this case, they rhyme, but they don't share a phonetic radical. So O minus means not share, O plus means share, uh, P plus means rhyme, P minus means doesn't rhyme. Uh, and then there are, of course, items that um, share a phonetic radical and rhyme and don't share a phonetic, ra phonetic radical and don't rhyme. So that's kind of the basic um, structure of the, the rhyming task. We also have meaning tasks. And uh, here we have uh, weak versus strong. Uh, so these are uh, weakly associated in terms of their semantics. These are uh, strongly associated in terms of their semantics. So things like lonely and grief versus money and bill. And then we have unrelated items. Um, so we have, uh, again, uh, parallel versions uh, in English that we have uh, developed. First, in terms of the Chinese developmental differences. So this is kind of like in school age kids from about second to, um, to, to, to seventh or eighth uh, grade. What we see is this developmental increase in a right middle occipital gyrus. Uh, so it seems as though as kids get better and better at reading, they're more thoroughly engaging this kind of right visual, spatial, visual orthographic uh, region. Uh, we don't see that in English. And actually, if you look at a direct comparison between the two languages, uh, which we've done, um, uh, you see that there is this, uh, here's right middle occipital gyrus. You see this developmental increase from kids to adults 
in uh, Chinese, but you don't see a difference in, uh, in English uh, participants. However, if you look at auditory phonological regions, uh, you see kind of like the mirror effect. So what you see in these auditory phonological regions is you see a developmental increase for English kids, but you don't see a change for the, um, uh, for the uh, Chinese uh, kids versus adults, right? So you have this kind of nice uh, dissociation uh, um, uh, in, the, in the data uh, here. Uh, the other area that we've been talking about in terms of phonological processing is the inferior uh, parietal uh, cortex. Uh, Tali mentioned that people believe that it's, you know, kind of involved in mapping between orthography and phonology. Um, so you'd expect to see it engage in more alphabetic languages, which have the systematic relationship. And in fact, what we see is, as, as kids become adults, as kids get older, you see this big developmental difference in uh, two different regions. Uh, of the inferior parietal cortex. Whereas for the Chinese individuals, you don't really see a difference in the parietal cortex. Um, so we can put all this kind of together uh, and argue that um, for Chinese, there's a greater importance of visual orthographic processing marked by increases in these right uh, occipital regions. And there seems to be lesser importance of phonology uh, marked by reduced importance of superior temporal and inferior parietal regions. Another way of saying that is that these phonological regions are more important for, uh, for uh, uh, learning to read uh, in English. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Doing okay? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, how much more time do you need? Oh, just another five minutes. I think I should be okay. I started a little late. Uh, so no problem. No okay, problem. Great, great. Um, so, so right. Uh, the last part that I'll talk about, which is short, uh, is uh, is um, is is uh, dyslexia in Chinese. Uh, it turns out that uh, dyslexia in Chinese, actually worldwide, is roughly uh, similar. Uh, about four to five percent of uh, kids. Uh, have uh, have dyslexia in uh, in Chinese, um, and uh, you know. But the the basic question is: Well, uh, does the reading problem in Chinese uh, emerge from uh, different underlying factors? Um, so we did this really interesting study where we took bilingual kids, actually, who are poor in both Chinese and English were poor in English uh, only. And then we had a control literacy group who were fine at reading in kind of both languages. And what we found is that those who were uh, poor at uh, both or poor in English showed this difference in terms of structure in the inferior parietal cortex, okay? So suggesting that, um, you know, uh, being poor in English is associated with kind of a deficit in phonological processing because this inferior parietal cortex is crucial for phonological processing. Those who were uh, just, uh, those who were um, kind of poor in English and Chinese um, showed this uh, difference in the fusiform. Um, those who were just poor in English didn't show a difference in the fusiform. So again, this suggests that perhaps uh, a crucial aspect of Chinese is visual, uh, visual orthographic processing. Um, and we have other data to suggest that this visual orthographic processing is important. Um, we've done another study looking at Chinese uh, dyslexics uh, and again, looking at um, um, gray matter uh, in that population. We did see differences kind of in various regions of the brain, but I'd just like to highlight here again that we have shown this difference in the right occipital cortex in this, uh, in this group. So um, it seems as though a deficit in English is associated more with phonological regions, a deficit in Chinese is associated with more orthographic regions. So the last bit I'd like to come back to is this idea of uh, morphological awareness. Um, uh, so morphological awareness seems to be particularly important in Chinese because of those uh, kind of semantic radicals. So this is a nice meta-analysis that came out showing that um, morphological awareness was more highly related than phonological awareness to reading in Chinese. 
Uh, whereas for English, it's actually the reverse. Uh, so phonological awareness is more highly associated with reading skill in English uh, as compared to morphological awareness. So we were interested in see the neural correlates of this and they used a kind of child-friendly version of a morphological awareness task where they gave a character which had a semantic radical and then they had to choose a picture um, that was related to that, uh, that um, component of the character. So this is the semantic radical. It, ha it has to do something with fish. Here's another uh, word uh, and here's the semantic radical it has something to do with uh, seashells. Uh, so they had to um, basically dissect a component of the word and say what meaning it was associated with. So we were very interested to see whether dyslexia in Chinese is marked by a particular deficit in morphological awareness. So we used a task similar to our rhyming task that we talked about before, but in this case, we manipulated morphology and semantics. So in these two uh, items, um, uh, 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 kind of the morphology and semantics conflicts. So here they have to say that they're unrelated despite the fact that they share a, uh, a semantic radical. Here they have to say they're related uh, despite the fact that they don't share a semantic radical. So you have that kind of incongruent information as compared to the congruent information. And long story short is that uh, typical readers were sensitive to this congruent versus incongruent information in the frontal cortex. You can see it in two separate regions of the frontal cortex, whereas those with reading disability weren't sensitive to uh, this morphological information, suggesting that they have a particular kind of deficit in morphological uh, awareness. So, uh, so Chinese show alteration in the visual orthographic uh, regions uh, and also semantic morphological regions. This seems to be uh, kind of a unique characteristic associated with reading difficulty in Chinese. So just to wrap it all up, uh, there's uh, evidence for robust behavioral transfer between the languages. That seems to be a characteristic uh, property. Uh, and this is uh, resulting from the, um, a lot of neural overlap between the languages. Although there are some differences uh, for sure, uh, probably related to proficiency, um, but also could be related to the structure of the language, right? So Chinese due to its structure seems to engage more visual spatial mechanisms and semantic morphological mechanisms, whereas English seems to engage more uh, phonological mechanisms. And uh, when reading breaks down, it seems to kind of selectively uh, be reflected in these language uh, specific regions. So with that, uh, hopefully we have a little time for questions. <laughs> I'm going to ask a totally out of the blue question for myself for a moment. I wanna know whether there have been uh, MRIs in reading for Braille. In other words, for, for non-sighted people, whether they also have the same areas uh, with language acquisition. Yep, that's a great question. Um, there have been a few studies done. And uh, yeah, what they, so there's this area, you know, in the temporal cortex that's really involved in orthographic processing that we've been talking about. And um, it turns out that even if individuals can't see um, when they uh, uh, kind of read Braille, uh, they actually activate this visual region <laughs> uh, of the brain. So it seems as though this area of the brain is really important in kind of uh, hooking up uh, your kind of representations of um, kind of orthographic word forms with language more generally. So it doesn't seem to be dependent upon whether something is visually presented. So in the case of blind, they develop this uh, area for, uh, for tactile representations of, um, of words. Edith, uh, we'll have, after Edith, we'll be moving yeah. on. Um, I know you probably can't answer all, but maybe it will be food for thought. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming from being a teacher and educator and learning uh, languages. I'm a bilingual. I, I learned English since I was four. I read since I was four and five. 
Hebrew and English. And I learned from TV and from, I call it from the air languages. Okay, so this is my background. And Asian languages, especially Chinese, uh, Korean and Japanese come from uh, Chinese, right? Some, something like that, in a way, the written words as well. Okay, yeah. so this is where I come from. Uh, my question is that a twist, uh, if you thought in the terms of the mythology as in terms of not professional terms as, as in drawings and symbolisms in this uh, context. Uh, so does it mean that uh, if the dyslexia is different uh, and the process of learning those letters is different because maybe people with a uh, higher sensitivity, imagination can learn faster or uh, learn in a better way. So maybe the dyslexia is a different manifestation, a different manifestation of a different thing. That's my question. Uh, okay, yeah, I about um, it. <laughs> I'm not sure I got the, the whole question, but um, yeah, it seems as though one kind of characteristic that is similar across uh, reading difficulty in many languages is this idea of uh, fluency. Um, so if you uh, have a task which requires them to uh, quickly translate the visual form into its meaning or its pronunciation, that seems to be uh, kind of negatively impacted in the case of, uh, of dyslexia. And that seems to be kind of a general characteristic. So for example, you know, in uh, say, so in more transparent languages, um, uh, folks can uh, very rapidly uh, learn the, the kind of rules, so there is not really a problem with accuracy. It's more, more in uh, in fluency, and I think you find that, you know, in uh, in Chinese as well. The other interesting thing about Chinese, I suppose, is it seems as though, and I didn't talk about it, but it seems as though the writing is very important. Um, so maybe this relates to your question about imagination. Uh, or in terms of visualization, um, one way that um, Chinese is effectively taught is uh, lots of practice. Um, so lots of writing practice. And there's this area of the brain called Exner's area, um, which seems to be involved in um, the motor programs associated with writing. Uh, and um, yeah, it seems as though that area of the brain in high skilled readers of Chinese is robustly engaged. So people have argued that reading depends upon writing in Chinese. Um, it's not as though it's not important in alphabetic languages. In fact, it is. Uh, so there have been studies looking at alphabetic languages too, which show that, yeah, writing, in fact, improves your orthographic, your visual representations. Um, but it seems to be particularly important in Chinese due to the kind of um, uh, the visual nature of the writing uh, system. Turns out that, um, you know, uh, Chinese used to be more logographic or, picto or pictographic, but that has uh, evolved over time. So some of the characters kind of maybe look a little bit like what they're referring to, but most of them don't. Uh, there are actually very okay. few. Uh, most so of it's, them. Not, it's not like, because I remember when I was younger, we, we were taught a bit of Japanese and I know it comes from the same language as well. Like Chinese is like the mother language in a way that uh, this picture is like a human being or stuff like that. So this means stuff like that. So it's not like that anymore. No, there are there are a few um, uh, more pictographic kind of characters, but uh, and I don't know, maybe if you like knew about the history, I mean there okay. are some like some uh, historical studies that have looked at the character over you know over centuries and and mm -hmm. show how it evolved from like I don't know a horse to its current form. <laughs> but if you look at its current okay. form, it used to look like a horse, but now it looks nothing like a horse. Uh, okay, but, so now it's like letters, but uh, more uh, complex letters than uh, pictures that it used to be. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it, it, basically you have components uh, corresponding to syllables, more or okay. less. So, so it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if it's in China or Taiwan or other countries that you learn the, the writing or the reading. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, in Hong Kong, they have Cantonese, which is a different oral language. Um, 
and you know, but I'm not sure Taiwan, do they still have the, I'm not sure if they still have the complicated or the complex characters. They simplified the characters in mainland China. So oh, okay. maybe that's a big difference, the simplified characters in mainland and they still use the complicated ones in Taiwan. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the idea, I guess, even in uh, mainland China, there are many different dialects, you know, big one, Cantonese. Oh, so even Mandarin. the written and the dyslexic. I'm going to interfere here. Okay. I, I have to apologize. I'm going to interfere here because uh, we want to move on to the last presentation yeah. and I don't want to take too much time away from Hidran. So uh, thank you very, very much, James. And pardon, I didn't say thank you before moving on to here. But uh, our last presenter, although he's at Northern Arizona University, is not there at the moment. He'll probably tell us that. And uh, Hidran Dronjik will be telling us about what research can teach you about teaching second language vocabulary. And Hidran, you're invited to take the share and uh, begin. Okay, um, let me try to share my screen. Mm. Ah, yes. Let's see. For sure you'll succeed. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Uh, wonderful, and let me just scroll up. And also, Here we go. So uh, hello from Zagreb in Croatia. I am on vacation and I actually, I planned my whole schedule and trips around this seminar on Friday. <laughs> I thought it was happening on Friday. Fortunately, uh, Tali was able to contact me and I was in a condition where I could log on and, uh, and here I am. So I was, I, this is completely unexpected. I was going to do this in two days, essentially. We're happy uh, to have you. <laughs> yes, uh, happy to be here. It was uh, lovely to hear uh, James and Tali speak. And um, I'm kind of, I guess we're going to, to sh shift gears a little bit and talk about vocabulary. Um, this talk was, well, actually, there's an article that comes with this talk that I've sent to Jay and Jay's going to share it as well as the slides. Uh, the article contains um, a lot of links uh, to things that I'm going to mention today. And um, the slides themselves also have embedded links so you can you can sort of use either to access the resor resources that I'm going to talk about or that I'm going to mention. Um, the basic idea of this talk is that it's it's interactive. Um, unfortunately, we're on Zoom and um, it's extremely difficult to, to have something very interactive on Zoom. So I do apologize that I'm going to talk. There are going to be times when I'm going to ask you to um, say something in the chat. And um, if you will indulge me, that would be wonderful. So, um, the first thing that we could uh, briefly consider is how complex lexical knowledge is. Um, and sorry, I have, oh gosh, I have only, uh -huh, here we go. I have one screen here, so um, I hope I'm going to be able to see my slides as I, as I talk. Oh, I wonder if I could, no, that's not gonna work. Okay, um, so there are various things that we need to know when uh, we need to know a word in a language. Um, first of all, uh, something to think about is whether the knowledge is receptive or productive. Uh, receptive knowledge, so understanding a word in a second language is easier than uh, producing a word in that language, uh, which should come as no surprise. Um, one thing that we need to know is the form of the word, both spoken, and if we're aiming to be literate, we also need to know how the word is written. But there are many things about the form of the word. So what are the sound segments? What is the stress? Uh, is there lexical tone? 
And if so, what kind of tone and where is it placed? How do you spell the word? What is its morphological structure and so on? Um, we also need to know the meaning of the word, obviously, and there are various aspects to uh, word meaning um, that I'm listing here in these uh, on the slide. Um, then something we could call word grammar. So um, how does the word like to combine with other words and what sorts of morphology, for example, and what sorts of syntax it asks for? So in languages that have cases, for example, certain prepositions or postpositions are going to ask for a specific case. And that's something that a learner needs to know too. Um, uh, we also need to know collocation, about collocation. So what words will a word agree with? For example, we do say, we think of fast and quick as uh, synonyms, but fast food and fast food is okay, but quick food is not something that we really say. Uh, also, we take a quick shower, but we don't take a fast shower, and we take a fast train, but on a quick train. So this is another thing that um, somebody learning a language needs to, to be aware of, um, and somehow they need to get there. Um, we also have knowledge of what, we, what I call network knowledge. So basically, uh, what other words have meanings that are similar to to the word that you're learning, what other words sound similar, um, what other words have similar morphology, what are synonyms, antonyms, superordinates, subordinates, and so on. Um, all these connections are real. Psycholinguists have, sh and neurolinguists as well, have shown that the, these connections um, actually exist in the brain and in the mind. Um, also, learners need to acquire sociolinguistic and pragmatic knowledge of, of a word. So how do you use a word that you know? Um, so obviously looking at all these different ways of having or of knowing a word, uh, it should be clear that there's no one correct way of teaching or learning. Uh, so different conditions of learning and teaching are probably going to lend themselves better to certain aspects of word learning. Uh, but if we think of where learn, word learning starts, it starts at connecting one form, the sound of the word or how the word is written to a meaning, right? If you don't have that basic connection between a word, a form of a word, the form of a word and its uh, meaning, there's no way that you can learn any of these other things, right? So that would be the place to start when teaching somebody a new word. Um, the next thing I would like to sort of like to think about briefly is the size of a person's vocabulary. So how many words do we tend to know in a language? Um, and how many words do we need to know when learning a language so that we can use it. Um, the first question is how do you even count words? And based on that, uh, the answer about vocabulary size is going to be very different. Uh, so if you look at words like play, plays, played, and playing, these are four words. Uh, they look like four different words. If we were to count these separately, we would say, okay, I have four words going on here. Um, however, if we considered play to be one word that has separate forms, like play, plays, played, and playing, that are all somehow connected, then we might say, well, I really only have one word here that, that's only changing very slightly, right? Uh, or I might, have, I might have two words if I say that one, the verb is one and the noun is, is another because they won't share all their forms. Uh, maybe I have more if I consider something like to play cards to be a different word from to play someone, okay? So based on how I decide to count, I'm going to have um, a different word count um, in any given text or any given vocabulary. Um, something that second language vocabulary researchers settle on is uh, word families. This is what they decide to count out of convenience and for some pedagogically uh, based reasons. Um, a word family is basically um, a, a base or a stem 
like play and all the inflected so grammatical forms and all the derived forms uh, so play plays player unplayable playful and playfulness for example would all count as a single word family um, the reason for this is simple um, the logic goes that if you know the basic meaning of the word and if you know the meaning of the affixes prefixes and suffixes for example in english then you can easily infer uh, what each of these uh, actually mean this is not fully true however um, for example if you have depart and departure you would say yeah these words are probably the same word family because i know depart and i know u r e as a suffix and I can kind of guess what departure means if I know depart. But if we have something like depart and department, where you can't really, the, the meaning is not transparent anymore. You can't guess what department means if you know depart. Um, then vocabulary researchers would probably count this as two word families, separate word families. Uh, also, compounds would count as uh, different word families. So horseplay and playtime, uh, these would be different word families, although they share the, the uh, component play. Okay, um, so one question that you want to ask yourself as a teacher is if my student is trying to read something or if my student is trying to understand a conversation, how many words do they need to know? Uh, to understand what percentage of the text or, or the conversation. Um, so if we start with somebody who knows 2,000 word families, this is in English, and coverage will actually differ. These figures would differ from language to language, but we have data. We have lots of data for English. So if you know 2,000 of the most frequent word families in English, uh, you will understand 86% of a text. And you would think, well, this is a wonderful start, right? 86% of a text for only 2,000 word families, that's great, right? But the problem is that this isn't really very useful. Uh, so here's an example of what a text would look like to you if you knew 2,000 word families in English. You would have a lot of words that you still didn't understand. And if you try to get an idea of what this means, you can clearly see that you can kind of guess the topic, but you really can't extract the full meaning um, of the passage here. Or, uh, this is actually a sentence, right? Um, so this is what English text looks like to somebody who's trying to read it with 2000 word families. You know what the problem is? Most English as a second language learners don't really know many more than 2,000 word families. This is their world when they try to read English. Um, okay, so the thing is that as you learn more word families, so, okay, you know, 2,000, so now you're going to know three and four and five, uh, you have diminishing returns. So that, for example, if you, um, if you know 1,000 word families, you understand about 78% of the text. If you, know, if you learn another 1,000, you will only expand your understanding by another 8%. You add another 1,000 and it drops by half. So now you're only adding four more percent of understanding. And it just goes, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so basically, the more you learn, the less you're progressing in actually understanding uh, texts. Uh, and that's kind of depressing and sad, because it's very costly to learn a, a thousand word families in, in terms of time and effort. So um, basically, for an average text, in order to understand an average text, about 95%, uh, you will need to know three to 4,000 word families in English, um, the most frequent ones. Um, that means that on a page of 300 words, you're still going to have 15 words that you don't understand at all. And it means that you're going to have to use the dictionary all the time 
or you, you might have to, you know, use these newer tools like hovering above a word so its meaning or definition will um, show up. But whatever you do, uh, your reading experience is not going to be very pleasant because you're going to be stopping all the time and these interruptions are not going to allow you to get an idea about the whole text uh, as, as one does when one reads. Uh, so in order to get to a smoother reading experience, you need to know about 98% of the words on the page, right? And that means that you actually need to know about 9,000 word families. Um, this will leave you with six unknown words per page. And this is also where guessing becomes possible. So if you know this many words, you can now start guessing fairly effectively and you're gonna have a much more uh, pleasant reading experience. Um, for an average conversation, it's about 7,000 uh, word families to get to that 98% coverage and be able to infer uh, what the unknown words mean. Um, if we look at a university graduate in an English speaking country, who, who speaks English as the first language, they know about 20,000 word families. Now, there is a lot of variation uh, between individuals, but this, is, this would be the average. Uh, now, Jay, I just wanna say, be because I have this tiny screen here, I only see one person and I can sort of tell they're moving right now, but uh, if something happens, uh, please, if I start freezing or something due to an unstable internet connection, do interrupt me or try to let me know that, that you don't hear me. I so don't know far, how that... so good. Okay, great. So far, so good. And nobody has written me any questions in the chat uh, until now. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, and I didn't even bring up the chat because it would crowd more of my screen. Okay, uh, so some questions that we need to sort of think about. Uh, I guess first, first of all, teachers think about whether they should just, should they teach vocabulary actively as, as, a, as a concerted effort? Uh, yes, you should, because uh, vocabulary is the single best predictor in statistical models of comprehension. Uh, it accounts for 50% of reading comprehension and listening comprehension scores. That, that's a huge amount of variance if you, if you know any statistics so, to, to, to be accounted for by a single variable. Um, study after study shows us that vocabulary does not teach itself. It doesn't happen in, in a classroom setting unless you actually make an effort. Uh, learners are consistently shown study after study to not know enough vocabulary. So for example, uh, one study, for example, shows that uh, English majors in China uh, know 4,000 word families after two, almost two and a half thousand hours of instruction. Uh, Japanese university students who are not majoring in English, uh, 2,300 word families after 1,200 hours of study. Uh, and Israeli uh, high school graduates have been shown, you're not doing too badly actually, uh, have been shown to know about three and a half thousand families after one and a half thousand hours of instruction. Um, so this isn't bad, but it's still not enough for fluent comprehension. Um, so, do students learn useful words is another question. Uh, and maybe you can guess that the answer would be no, not always. Uh, so when you think about naturalistic vocabulary learning, so how children acquire their native language, the vocabulary of their native language, um, it's driven by frequency of encounter. So it's, 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 it's what words you hear your parents speak uh, is, is what you actually learn. Uh, in second language learning, this is not the case because curriculum, teacher decisions, uh, the kind of learning situations and learning materials all distort this natural frequency that, that words uh, occur in or with. And what also makes the, what exacerbates the situation is that learning materials, so textbooks are typically not produced 
in such a way that they would facilitate vocabulary learning in a way that it should be happening, right? So we have this confluence of really terrible conditions uh, that conspire against the learner. Uh, so it's been shown over and over that learners in classrooms with uh, that don't have a focus on vocabulary, you know, a dedicated strand of instruction, uh, basically do not learn the first two thousand word families fully. Uh, observation studies have also shown that instruction can be fairly hap haphazard. So, for example, Horst in observing a I think this was uh, an intermediate uh, class for French speakers in Montreal. It was an English class. Uh, Observe the teacher teach the, the words cummerbund and grungy. And the, the, her learners didn't know the first 2000 word families and cummerbund and grungy are not very useful words at all. Okay. so so. Teachers are guilty. I, I've been a teacher once. We're definitely guilty of, I mean, a language teacher. We're guilty of teaching words that our students may not really need that much uh, at their stage of language development. Uh, Mid-frequency vocabulary is something that's very important and is often neglected. Uh, Mid-frequency would be defined as words uh, above the first 2,000 most frequent families, so something like three to 10,000. And neither textbooks nor teachers teach these systematically. Uh, here are some examples of, of words that occur uh, in the sort of third uh, band, third thousand frequency bands, things like academic and consist and rapid and vocabulary itself. Uh, in the next thousand, we have agricultural and dense and particle. In the next thousand most frequent word families, we have things like penguin. Okay, not the most useful word, probably school children is very useful. Uh, axis, sinister, taper, things like this. Then in the next uh, 1000, we see undergraduate. Uh, in the next 1,000, things like hypothesis and semester. So you can see that these are uh, great words to know. And uh, what's particularly important is uh, most academic vocabulary that's not discipline specific, but that's universal to most academic environments lives in these frequency bands. And so this is where you'd wanna, th this is something that you need to focus on essentially. Um, and I see something in the chat. Let me just check. Aha, uh -huh. I'm, I'm very glad to, I'm very glad to hear this, essentially, um, that, that at least one curriculum in the world <laughs> is moving toward, in, 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 the, in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm covering my own question here. So can students acquire an adequate vocabulary uh, by doing a lot of reading for pleasure, essentially. There are people in the field who advocate reading for pleasure as an effective way of learning uh, second language vocabulary. Uh, the answer to this question is no. Uh, so much work has been done that shows that if you only have students read, they will never learn enough vocabulary. Reading is great, but it's not the way to learn that initial four meaning connection. It's actually a terrible way to do that. Uh, so you need about at least six, but, but often as many as 15 encounters or 17 encounters with a word to establish a connection between a, a form and a meaning. Uh, so Tom Cobb has shown that words outside the first 2000 word families in English are simply not encountered by students often enough for this to ever happen, ever. Uh, also, I mentioned that you can't just guess word meanings from context. Uh, and Batia Laufer from Israel has actually shown that you need uh, to know, you need to have one unknown word out of 20 uh, approximately to be able to guess words from context. Uh, for a learner who only knows 2000 word families, the ratio is one in 10. 
and so they can't guess. So whenever a teacher says, oh, just guess the words, they can't. Uh, another problem with reading to learn that initial connection between a form and a meaning is that when the context is supportive and, and you're actually able to guess uh, what an unknown word means, this is when your brain just decides that it doesn't have to remember it because you think, oh, this is easy. I know this word. Why would I invest energy in actually remembering it? And so when you guess, you don't learn, which is terrible. My name uh, is Sarah Rosen. My number is 646. 942 uh, I know you're busy. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so when reading for pleasure, studies have shown that if you read 1,000 words, you learn about one word. Uh, if you're not paying, if you're not do, if, if it's not a vocabulary learning task, but just reading for pleasure. Uh, if you will, mindlessly or not paying attention to vocabulary. So this is not very efficient. Another question that often comes up in conversations with teachers is what kind of dictionary should my learners use? I see something in the chat. Uh, I have to open it. If you'd yes. like me to read for you there. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, yeah, I see this. So graded readers are great, but they're also not very good. Uh, on, if you, they're not very good for learning a four meaning connection. It's much more efficient to teach the meaning of a word and then have them read graded readers, which are excellent for every other kind of, of word read, learning, except this initial step, yeah? Uh, Yes, and great, great point there as well. Okay, so what kind of dictionary should your learners use? Uh, often, English teachers at least um, say that monolingual dictionaries are the way. So you have the English word and you have an English definition of that word, right? Um, normally, I would ask you to tell me why you think this is a good idea, but I don't think we're gonna do it in the interest of time. I'm simply going to tell you that um, Teachers often say that when you use a monolingual dictionary, you're practicing English, and that's really great, right? Uh, the problem is that to use a monolingual dictionary, you first need a vocabulary because you need to understand those definitions. Uh, studies of the, the size, vocabulary size that you need to understand a monolingual dictionary show that th these are simply not useful to most learners. Uh, they, they don't understand the definitions. The definitions are too complicated, even in learner dictionaries. Um, so there have been several studies of m comparing monolingual, bilingual, and something called bilingualized dictionaries. Bilingualized would mean that it combines a monolingual and a bilingual approach. So it has a definition in the second language followed by a translation into the first language. So the best study that I'm aware of is Lev 2004. This is a Polish researcher who basically uh, did a, a big study with learners of all proficiency levels, controlled the study very well in terms of designing these parallel forms of the dictionary. And the, finding is, the findings are actually consistent. Uh, if you're trying to support reading comprehension, uh, the best dictionary is the bilingual dictionary, which means the dictionary that translates words into the first language. After that, the bilingualized and then the monolingual dictionary. And this, uh, this applies across proficiency levels. It's not that your uh, high proficiency students are gonna magically want to use a monolingual. I mean, maybe they'll want to use a monolingual dictionary, but it's still not ideal for them. They, they learn words better if they use a bilingual dictionary and then just do a lot of reading afterwards. Uh, it's, a, it's a way better strategy. Um, now, I also have to move this because I don't see the question that I'm asking. Should translation be used when teaching vocabulary? This is also a big one. Um, if we think about what... Uh, Let's say we have a, 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 an English-speaking 
a student who's trying to learn Spanish, uh, they want to express the idea uh, of a tree. Okay, so in their first language, well, it's tree. Uh, in Spanish, this word happens to be árbol. Okay, so what happens in the mind of the learner? It's been shown through psycholinguistic research that what happens is that they form a connection between, and this is not shocking, everybody who's ever learned a foreign language knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you learn that árbol means tree. So you create a connection between the sound and the visual form of the second language word to the first language word. Note that it doesn't connect directly to the idea. So in order to access the idea, you, you, you take two steps, essentially, when you're a beginning learner of a language. You go árbol, and then you translate in your head, and then you get the idea of what the word means, right? Mm hmm Yes. Yes. Um, exactly. The thing is that we never learn, um, we never learn these patterns of usage from a dictionary. We learn them from use. And, and the first task when you're learning a new word is to learn the connection between a form and a meaning. Everything else then happens through actual c communication and through reading and through listening. Okay. Uh, so this is the first step. Everybody translates uh, at, when they start learning uh, a second language. Then connections are formed in the opposite direction, and, and these are weaker. So we all have this intuitive feeling, which is actually correct, that it's easier to understand a second language word than to produce it. Um, eventually, uh, after some time, uh, connections start forming between the conceptual level, the ideas, the semantic level, and the actual second language forms. But this takes time and beginners do not have these connections. So whether you want it or not, they're gonna be translating because that's the only way that their brains will actually function. Uh, translation equivalents have been shown to be activated automatically in normal bilingual processing. This is just uh, a fact. Um, now, there is a problem with, obviously, with teaching through translation, and that's that uh, translation equivalents are never full equivalents, or very rarely, you know, maybe, maybe in some, for some technical terms, they will actually be exact. But typically, there's a partial overlap. So, for example, Serbo-Croatian learners of English will often say, uh, can I have a plastic glass? And this is because the word for glass uh, just happens to mostly overlap with the glass glass. And they can't even imagine that you, you have to say plastic cup in English. And, and they'll make this type of mistake. Um, still, learning a translation is simply, it's been shown over and over in research to be the most efficient way of, of learning this initial connection. Uh, cognates like English uh, mother and Spanish madre are uh, learned more easily. They're also forgotten uh, with more difficulty. So it, you, you really have to try hard to forget a cognate. And they, they've also been shown to boost the test scores for second language learners, um, which is kind of not a surprise. Um, if you have cross-script cognates, for example, uh, a friend and colleague of mine did a study of Ukrainian uh, learners learning English. So inflation is inflatia. In terms also, uh, Cognates can be difficult to recognize. For example, pioggia in Italian, which means rain, and pluja in Catalan. It may need some pointing out. Uh, cane in Italian, which means dog, and chi in Welsh also may need some pointing out. Um, false friends are also a little bit of a problem, uh, whether related or not. So the, the famous example of embarrassed in English, embarazada in Spanish, which means pregnant. Uh, and burro, which means uh, butter in Italian, but burro means uh, donkey in uh, Spanish. So, so these kinds of things can sometimes be uh, a pitfall for learners. 
Um, now, rote learning is another uh, thing that's that's often discussed in classrooms and among teachers, and also it's it's reviled, I guess. Uh, it's reviled as boring and uncreative, uh, and uh, modern teachers like to say that, well, it's not critical thinking, you're just memorizing things, right? Um, however, uh, research in cognitive psychology just shows us that you can't have critical thinking if you first don't have knowledge that that critical thinking is going to operate on. So you actually need a memorized bank of facts in order to be able, that are accessed quickly and reliably uh, before you can do uh, critical thinking. Uh, so what, what teachers uh, and researchers have tried over and over again is, is to help learners not have to memorize uh, the connections between a form and a meaning. And so they've come up with, you know, teaching through miming and teaching through pictures and mnemonic uh, techniques like, like the, uh, the keyword mnemonic. Uh, for example, if you wanted to learn the Spanish word payaso, which means a clown, uh, and you were an English speaker, you would imagine something that sounds like this word. So pie sounds a little bit like payaso. And then you would uh, imagine a scene in your mind where a clown has pie in his face and whatever, or is smashing a pie into somebody else's face. Uh, and actually this, this leads to, to really good remembering, probably better than learning just the list. Not, not probably, actually it's been shown to be the case in studies. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't lead to naturalistic processing. I mean, just imagine yourself as a, as a second language learner uh, tr trying to have a quick conversation or trying to, to remember, to understand a word, and you go through these steps of imagining a clown and a pie, and I mean, it's just not going to work. And, and again, there are experiments that show that this actually slows you down terribly and, and it leads to worse comprehension. Uh, basically, the single best way to learn four meaning connections is to simply remember what the word means and then move on and do a lot of reading and a lot of practice and a lot of communicative stuff. Once you've learned that basic connection is, is really important. Uh, another thing that uh, we often do in classrooms that we should not be doing is teaching different kinds of, of, of the same thing. For example, apple, pear, peach, and plum, okay? This is a terrible idea. It sounds like it might be a great idea because the words are connected, but it leads to terrible learning outcomes. Uh, what happens is that if you don't know pear and you don't know apple and your teacher teaches you both, uh, many of the, in many of the cases, you're going to learn that apple, the, the idea of the apple goes with the word pear. You're going to cross label or label these things wrongly and then remember them wrongly. Um, so it's a very bad idea to teach words in semantic sets uh, when they're the same kind of thing, like different kinds of relatives, different kinds of furniture, different kinds of fruits, no. Uh, there is a way around this, however, uh, if you think of a visual scene, for example, a living room, uh, you could have a table there and on the table you could have a magazine. Uh, maybe you will have, um, a piece of fruit there, maybe you will have a mug, you will have some eyeglasses, and maybe a tablet. Uh, these are not the same kind of thing, but they're objects that go together. And so uh, you can have meaningful teaching materials without taking a page out of a picture dictionary with all the fruits and then teaching papaya and mango and you know, you don't have to, to really do that. Um, Ideally, also, if the parts of speech don't overlap, um, that will lead to better uh, retention. Okay, let me just move this. Um, so are certain kinds of words easier to learn? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, so for example, concrete words are remembered better than abstract words. Um, 
cognates are remembered better than non-cognates. We mentioned this already. Uh, general terms are uh, remembered better than register specific terms. So paternal is a formal way of saying fatherly. Fatherly is remembered better. Uh, words that are one word, like decide, are actually remembered better than words that are expressions, like make up one's mind. And uh, words that have few meanings are easier to learn than words that have many meanings. So papaya is easier than set. I see something in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. OK. Um, so basically, uh, to wrap up, um, I simply have a, a quick catalog of, of best practices. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of time to talk about all of them, but if you're interested, you can always go to the article that Jay is going to share, and uh, it's all outlined there in, in detail. Uh, so one thing that you need to know is how many words your learners already know. And to, to do this, if you're teaching English, you're in luck, I guess, because there are a lot of uh, tests available. They're not always the best tests, but they're the best we have uh, for adult learners. Uh, you have the vocabulary size test. Uh, you have the vocabulary levels test. And the links are both going to be on the slides and in the article. Uh, you also have other size tests uh, that you can uh, check out. Um, the first goal for instruction, in my opinion, is to systematically try to teach the first 3,000 word families. A lot of vocabulary researchers agree with me on this. Um, you can access frequency lists and then use them to inform your teaching to make sure that you're not teaching words that are too difficult and not relevant for your learners at the, at the current stage of learning. Uh, you can use tools like vocabulary profilers that will tell you how difficult your text is. Uh, and this is a great one to try. It's free as well, and it's easy to use. Uh, it will also show you what words are too difficult and how to replace them with simpler synonyms, essentially, that are more frequent. Uh, your next task would probably be to teach in, in some kind of systematic way to try to teach as much mid-frequency vocabulary as possible. Uh, if your learners are learning to learning the second language to study subjects in it later, then you will also want to teach them general academic vocabulary and their vocabulary lists of that available as well, uh, which you will find links to in the article. Uh, low frequency vocabulary, things like expressions like it's raining cats and dogs that nobody ever says, uh, things like cummerbund, even if you're tempted to just don't teach them, skip them, or if you really must address really quickly, move on, would be my best advice, I guess. Uh, vocabulary needs to be recycled. Uh, so uh, to create those multiple uh, occasions when learners access the memory, uh, it's probably a good idea to, to space this out. So a couple of times of this on the same day, repeat the word in different contexts, then the next day, and then a couple of days later, or maybe at the end of the week, you can have some kind of vocabulary test. Uh, so there are ways to actually um, sort of create systematic revision. Um, I talk about this more in the article too. Um, definitely encourage your learners to, to be active, autonomous learners of vocabulary. Uh, one great tool, um, the Leitner box, uh, is described in a little more detail in the article. Uh, you can make it out of a shoe box, essentially, or any kind of box where you just have different compartments. The idea is that it, it helps you recycle vocabulary by uh, sort of forcing you to test yourself on multiple occasions. So when you first add a flashcard uh, with, a, with a new word, you put it in, in the first compartment, then you test yourself. And if you know the word, you promote it to the next uh, compartment and so on until it gets to the last compartment when you just kick it out and save it for maybe periodic uh, review. But if you fail, 
at any one of these points, you sort of, you look at a word, you don't know what it means, it goes back to, it's demoted back to the initial compartment. And, and so you're forced to, to do it again. Um, there are also apps that do this. They're available, they're free uh, for all sorts of mobile devices. I personally, when studying something, when studying a new language, I prefer to have a physical uh, card, index card. And I think this is just because somehow it's, 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 more, it's a more real experience for me then, than if it's uh, on a mobile device. Uh, it's important to do this translation and test yourself in both directions, L1 to L2, as well as L2 to L1. Uh, so you have some, some apps linked in, in the article and in the slides. And I think uh, this is just about my last slide. Uh, you can do thematic groupings, but do not do semantic sets, things of the same kind, bad idea. Uh, having learners generate example sentences that are meaningful to them will lead to better retention than giving them a generic uh, example sentence. Uh, variable form is good. So having different speakers, maybe transcribing the word in IPA, that's been shown to enhance uh, learning. Even transliterating in the L1 script has been shown to enhance uh, retention. Uh, at, at first learning, at first encounter, having variable meanings is a bad idea. Uh, so only focus on one meaning of a word and forget about all the other meanings. I know it's very tempting to say, well, and this can mean this, and this can mean that, and bad idea. It'll just uh, lead to worse retention. Uh, basically, for initial form meaning relationship learning, I would, I would encourage mindful translation. Uh, with a bilingual dictionary, and then massive, massive, massive communicative practice, all the good stuff that we do um, as teachers. That would basically be it. Um, I can open the chat. Uh, okay, so, so Leo says, um, typical for native English speaking trainees. So uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that, please? And if you'd like to turn on your microphone, I think that would be great because I'm done talking. Yeah, hi. No, yeah, I mean, thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Vedran, for this uh, talk. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but um, what I meant mm -hmm. is that tendency for uh, na particularly, I, I've, I've observed it in native English because the, the nature of sort of our uh, population here we have sort of uh, lots of native english speaker teacher trainees and non-native speakers so i find i've observed this tendency in particularly in native mm -hmm. speakers to kind of well i would sort of attribute it to what we call it a monosemic bias kind of uh thinking of uh words as sort of having one meaning and without sort of essentially realizing that words are Polysim, uh, essentially polysimus, right? And then and doing exactly what you sort of warned against, sort of bombarding uh, yeah. their students with those. Uh, you know, it can also it can also mean this, and it can also mean that, and you know, so we also have this expression with, you know, with this word which means something else, etc. That's all I wanted to. Say. I think I I think most of us have gotten excited if you if you've ever taught a language, you just get in this group of, oh, and I, you know, all these memes are showing up in your head and you're eager to share them, but it's a very bad idea in terms of actual retention. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Um, Pardon, I, that I, here. I personally have to say that I'm a little bit surprised how many bad ideas I actually liked, but uh, I, maybe I'll learn from that. Me too. I did all of this once at, at one point before I became a vocabulary researcher. Can I ask about the same issue that he talked just a second ago? Um, because in Hebrew, uh, most words have multiple meanings and sometimes they have the same idea, but at, as, um, there are, there's like tiny twists and sometimes it can be the same uh, word with the same way of talking, saying it, but a different meaning. So 
in a way you don't want to bombard them, but if you don't mention it, then especially with the person that just came to Israel and is living in society, it could be the opposite. It could be, I think, uh, I, think I, think here, so. <laughs> I think there's a danger that they will make a very serious faux pas. Then perhaps if, if you know, the typical example would be the word for a male chicken. Um, one of the versions of that word is definitely not something you want to say in, in North America, for example. You want to say rooster, but not the other one. And so uh, that kind of thing, I think, is very important. Uh, but I, otherwise, I just, uh, yeah, I would refrain from... Um, from bombarding students when, whenever it's possible and feasible not to. And so, I see- but, but does it mean, but does it mean not mentioning at all, but mentioning as in like skimming it, but not going too deep into it at that point? I think on, on different occasions. So once they've learned one meaning, then it's definitely time to, to introduce other meanings, uh, okay. but at, at, at it's this this has there's research on this basically it shows that when you when you provide multiple meanings at it, first encoding uh the memory trace is much worse and and recall is worse right okay. so it's it's hard cognitive psychology facts <laughs> um i see a okay. comment from dina um uh and and she says uh let me see uh -huh, yes well i uh, I think when I was a kid, I learned in my native language, I learned orange and brown on the same occasion. To this day, I, I don't know the difference when I have to make a decision very quickly, orange or brown, I will say the, the other one, okay? And I know the difference, I can see that, that they're different colors, uh, but spur of the moment, I will say orange when I wanna say brown and vice versa. And I, I'm sure my mother is guilty or my father because they taught me the two words at the same time. Andrew, and I had a question about, is that always the case though? Does it depend upon the nature of the thing you're learning? Because I think I remember like contrastive analysis, for example, for learning phonology is helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for, so, so here, I think we were talking about semantic sets, right? Oh yes, yeah, we right. were. But I'm, so, I'm wondering if that's, if that, I, I don't think that's true of learning in general. Yeah. It, at, at first encoding for vocabulary, it's detrimental, but once that you have, uh, once that you really know apple and once that you really know pear, then contrasting them is actually helpful. So the only thing that vocabulary researchers caution against is, is at initial encoding, providing multiple things that are at the same semantic level. If you have vehicle and car, that's even, that's less of a problem, but having car and truck, and your learners don't know either, that seems to be a bad idea. That's been shown over and over again. But car and driver, absolutely fine. Um, I'm going to interfere here because what I want to do is I want to say thank you to everybody. We uh, only encountered two serious technical difficulties. We were hoping for zero, but I guess uh, sometimes we can pass uh, that it's not that bad if that's, that's the way it was. Uh, I want to thank all of you, James, Tali, Vidran, and all of those who participated here. I apologize that I'm sort of uh, calling this, uh, calling it quits at the moment. But I think it's about time some of us have gotten a great deal of information here and it's, uh, it still has to be processed. So I'm very, very pleased that uh, all of you were with us here.